Hello, everyone. I am Michelle Carter from the Aram Public Library, and tonight is part three of Monarch Magic with Teresa DeWitt, our monarch butterfly enthusiast. Um, welcome, Teresa, and welcome, everyone, to our live Facebook event. Just so you know, please post comments in our comment feed and um, Teresa will answer them at the end of the program. And also thank you, this is part three. So welcome and thank you for joining us on this Monarch adventure. Tonight, Teresa will be talking about how we, we just people with regular backyards can help the mighty Monarch on their journey. Take it away, Teresa. Thanks, Michelle. And I'm just going to get started with the slideshow. Okay, so tonight I'm going to be talking about gardening for monarchs and pollinators and my focus as you know, is the monarchs. And uh, fortunately, what's good for the monarchs is also good for the pollinators. So um, whether you like monarchs or are, are thinking about the pollinators, it's all good. So we know that the biggest threat to monarchs and the pollinators is habitat destruction. And when we think about it as a global issue, I, I just think, what can one person do? What can we do to help the situation? And when I think of it globally, I'm like, there's nothing I can do. It's too big of a, it's too big of a problem. But I wanna help. I wanna know what can I do? And I went to a webinar this, this spring where um, Dr. Doug Telame was quoted. Uh, the webinar was put on by a Monarch Research Project, and so I will share the link to those webinars because they were they were value very valuable. Um, but anyway, Dr. Doug Tallamy said, "Don't worry about the entire globe; just worry about your yard." And that really resonated with me because I can't change the globe. I can't change what's ha happening anywhere else in the world, but I can change my yard. And if we all change our yard that changes the world, doesn't it? So um, I thought that was brilliant. I, I, I thought that when you look at it globally, it's overwhelming to the point of inaction. But when you put it in, in your yard, when it's your yard, suddenly it's manageable. So what I want to talk about tonight is, is what you can do in your yard. So this is my yard and it is nothing fancy whatsoever. Um, so in that webinar, one of the presenters said that well manicured yards are beautiful, but they are ec ecological dead zones. Pollinators get nothing from a nicely mowed yard. They need nectar sources and habitat. And he suggested that we convert 50% of our yard into a living landscape by planting native plants. I don't know about you, but for me, the thought of tearing up my 50% of my yard to plant native plants is not feasible for many reasons. And especially if you are living in town, it might not even be possible for you to do that. But you can still make a difference. You can change your yard just one plant at a time. And so after that webinar, I came and I looked at my yard and I'm like, okay, what can I do here? And if you look, you, well, I'm sure you see this square here. It's about 12 by 12, and it's where we used to have one of those pop-up pools from Walmart. And we were going to tear this space out and just seed it with grass. And then I went to that webinar, or watched that webinar, and I was like, oh my gosh, look at this. I have this space right here that's practically ready for me to plant for the monarchs and the pollinators. Now, before I go to the next slide, I wanna point out this sedum plant here. This is the most neglected plant probably in the whole Midwest. This poor plant I got for free from somebody who was dividing their plants. And for 10 years, it has been in that spot and it has only 
gotten chlorinated pool water. So this plant I thought probably should go, but we'll come back to this plant later on. Okay, so in the Midwest, in the Midwest, we produce enough to feed the entire world. Why can't we feed the pollinators? And this, this is all of us. We can all pitch in and help feed the pollinators. And you just do that one plant at a time. So I knew that I wanted milkweed for the monarchs, and I also knew I needed nectar sources for the monarchs, the butterflies, the pollinators. And so this is an example of my yard. This was probably in March I took this picture. And then the picture on the right was in June. And the I planted swamp milkweed and the butterflies are on the swamp milkweed. And down here, these orange blooms are butterfly weed. Um, and this tall plant back here is a swamp marigold. And then these are some irises. So a friend just gave me some bulbs and I'm not gonna turn down free plants. So I planted those as well. I didn't know, I thought maybe there'll be an early spring nectar source. I wasn't sure. I don't think anybody liked the irises, but, but I gave them a shot. Okay, and this is just what that little square space looks like. This was probably in July. And so you can see that the plants really grew up quite nicely. In the middle here, um, next year will be a pergola with a swing. So that's why I left that space open. And also a lot of the native plants say that they are invasive. And so I kind of wanted to leave room for, for them to spread, uh, hopefully spread. So that middle spot, I, I'm just leaving open for now. So you can see I have a mixture of natives and non-natives. And I will tell you, I am gardening specifically for the pollinators and the monarchs. And so the plants that I'm choosing, I am choosing them based on observation. What do I see the bees on? What do I see the monarchs on? And whatever I saw them on this year, I'm going to have more of those plants next year. Um, I'm also including non-natives because the monarchs like mon non-natives as well. So if they like it, they're gonna get it in my yard. Um, so, so when you are, are thinking about gardening for, for butterflies and pollinators, you need nectar sources. And you need nectar sources from early spring to late fall. And here's the good news. Some of the earliest nectar sources in the spring are dandelions, violets, and clover. So um, that's very freeing to me. I don't have to worry about those dandelions in my yard. I am feeding the pollinators. Late fall nectar sources, marigolds, goldenrod, um, and I'll show you a couple others um, that I've discovered. So anyway, you'll see the marigolds. I want to point out that some of these plants were just given to me. Some of them I bought at fundraisers. Um, but marigolds are a good nectar source for all of the pollinators, but not all marigolds are created equal. And I did not know this until this year. Um, that some of the modern varieties don't produce nectar or the petals are so, um, the blooms are so tightly, so compact that the bees and the butterflies can't get down to the nectar. So you want to be aware of that. And uh, so good, good varieties of marigolds are the French marigold, the signet marigold, and the mountain marigold. And I'm sure there's others on the list, but those were the top three. Um, swamp mil milkweed over here. I'm going to tell you right now, that's my favorite plant. You're going to get sick of me talking about that. And then over here, I want to point out, this is common milkweed. And how I got that was in the fall, I went and I dug up a couple plants from the ditch across the street from my house. And I transplanted it to, it was like over here. And it promptly died, or I thought it died, but I just left it. And then in the spring, I realized it was dead. But, and I cut it down, but then all spring, I kept getting little shoots popping up from those what I thought were dead plants. And the plants were dead, but milk, milkweed spreads underground via rhizomes. 
So that's what happened. I got four common milkweed plants from two or three dead stalks. Uh, so even when you think they're dead, don't give up hope because sometimes really great things happen, uh, especially with the milkweed. So that was pretty exciting. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you plant it, they will come and all sorts of species will come to your to your pollinator garden right here is our neighborhood feral cat. She decided this summer that she liked my butterfly garden. But also uh, cats of a different kind come. And this was the first monarch that I saw in my flower garden. And you can tell this was probably the end of May. Um, the plants are still pretty young. And this was the first one that I saw. And I just happened to look out the window. I'm sure I squealed with, with delight, grabbed my camera, ran outside, and my daughter ran out with me. And I snapped the picture and we just, I just stood there marveling at the fact that here was this butterfly that found our yard, found my, our milkweed. And my daughter looked at me and she said, mom, look, you did it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I did. I changed my yard. I changed the world one plant at a time. So you can do that too. You can change the globe. We can change the planet one plant at a time in our very own backyards. Um, as far as non-natives go, this was a really popular non-native. These are Mexican sunflowers. What I really like about them is they don't require very much water and pollinators of all kinds loved these flowers. I had swallowtails, painted ladies, monarchs, bees, um, everybody liked these Mexican uh, sunflowers. So they will be back in my yard probably double uh, next year. Um, but the absolute most popular plant in my yard when it's in bloom is the swamp milkweed. And you can see back here, there's blazing star, there's um, marigolds, zinnias, but everybody, everybody wants the nectar from the milkweed blooms, whether it's swamp milkweed or common milkweed, both varieties bloom and they are gorgeous. The blooms are beautiful, they're very fragrant and the pollinators love it. And these are all wild butterflies, like they're not ones that I released in my yard. Um, they're just ones that found my yard and they would not have been in my yard without the milkweed and without these nectar sources in my yard. So again, one plant at a time. So I'm gonna tell you, if you plant it, they will come. And it's not just the butterflies that will come. There's a whole community that lives on that milkweed. And I just love this quote, um, our ability to perceive quality in nature begins as in art with the pretty. And that is so true. The whole reason I started um, with the monarchs was because they're beautiful and they're interesting, but they are, they're just stunning. So they're, they're pretty, but there's a whole bunch of other, other insects and other life that comes when you start planting native plants. And I'm gonna talk specifically about milkweed because that's what I've been paying attention to the most. So when you plant milkweed, notice I said when, not if, when you plant milkweed, you should probably just go ahead and order this book. It's fascinating. It helps you identify all the insects that you will see on your milkweed. And so here's a few that um, I have personally seen, and I'm only going to show you the ones that I personally have seen. So here's something that I want to tell you. Nobody told me this, so I am going to be the friend that shares this information with you. When you plant milkweed, aphids will come. Aphids like milkweed as much as the monarchs do, and that's what these yellow insects are. Now, what are you going to do about that? Because look at how they've covered those leaves. And we're planting native plants to create a living habitat in your yard. So you don't want to use pesticides because that's going to kill the insects. 
and you want the insects. That's why we're planting these plants. So what do you do? I don't have an answer for that. Um, I tried squishing them with my fingers and I'm gonna tell you that's just disgusting. I can't do it. Then I tried, I read that you can just spray the leaves off with water. And that worked until it dawned on me, you know, I don't, there could be monarch caterpillars on these leaves and I'm spraying them off along with the aphids. And then I read to do nothing because there are other insects that will then come and eat the aphids. Lace wings will come, um, uh, ladybugs, hummingbirds eat aphids. And so finally I just gave up and I'm like, all right, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen with these aphids. And it got to the point where it was painful to look at my milkweed. And then all of a sudden the aphids were gone. And so I obviously had a good, a good thing going there. I had some other beneficial insects that were coming to take care of those aphids for me. And then here's some new, new insects in my yard. These are milkweed beetles, and you can see they're eating the seeds out of the pod. Um, some people can't stand them. I'm, I wasn't collecting the seeds, so I just let them do their thing. All right, these guys, I'm sure they were, well, they may have been in my yard before, but I never saw them. Um, praying mantids, both are non-native. This is, um, let's see, a Carolina mantis, which is from originally from Europe. And this is a Chinese praying mantis. And I'm gonna tell you, those things are creepy. When I was trying to take their picture and they turned and looked at me, Oh my gosh, I'm like, I'm a million times bigger than you, but I am getting the heck out of here. They freak me out. Um, they eat aphids and other insects, which is really great, but they also eat butterflies and they um, have been known to eat hummingbirds. So that's not so good, but I'm a no-kill yard. I'm not gonna kill them. Um, I'm planting natives to create that living habitat. And so if I'm gonna kill the ones that I don't want there, um, that seems to kind of go against that philosophy. Everything's connected, everyone belongs. So I just let them do their thing, but I, I'm very aware of them because they are, they're creepy cool. Um, okay, over here, this is a tussock moth caterpillar. And this guy, I included, this isn't the greatest picture, but I included him because to me, this picture really brought home that quote about an appreciation for nature begins with the pretty. Because I'm in the milkweed patch for the pretty. I'm there for the monarchs. But I looked over and I saw this cat, this um, grasshopper. And I, I mean, I know what a grasshopper is. I don't think I ever really paid that much attention to them before, but I looked at him and he looked at me. I felt like we made eye contact and I'm like, this is another living being out in this milkweed patch with me. And he just had this really cute Jiminy Cricket look on his face. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. But I, I am really appreciating that grasshopper. And so it really brought home that quote to me. I would have never stopped and noticed him before. Okay, so this is this fall. Um, I know a little bit more now than I did in the spring. And um, like I said, my plant selection going forward is based on my personal observations of what the monarchs and the pollinators are enjoying in my yard. And I know that I'm weak in the fall nectar sources. So I, I am planting specifically so that there are sources of nectar in my yard through, well, all through into late fall, I'm hoping. So this is kind of dead space in my yard and it was full of those orange daylilies that must have been there from the beginning of time based on the number of bulbs and the root systems that I dug out of here. And I'll probably be digging out them out of here for, for years to come. But I cleared it out enough that this is all common milkweed and goldenrod. 
and the tags on those say they're invasive and i'm hoping that's the case i'm hoping that this in a couple years is all filled in with goldenrod and common milkweed and it would not hurt my feelings if it spread up into my yard here that would eventually it'd be great if this were all native plants but for now i'd be really happy if this were all filled in so here's that sedum remember that poor neglected sedum uh, I knew that the bees liked it, and I think maybe I just never paid attention before, but guess who else likes it? The monarchs. I had so many butterflies on this sedum this fall. Monarchs, painted ladies, um, I believe there was even a swallowtail on, on the sedum. So from neglected to king of the yard, um, I really love this plant now and, and I will never, I will never get rid of it. It's, it's got a home in my yard forever. <laughs> and this was a cool discovery. This is, I was out in the yard and a monarch landed on this weed that's kind of on the edge of my yard. And I'd never noticed that weed before, but you know, a monarch is there, the pretty is there, so now I notice. And I did some investigating and this is called white snake root. And white snake root has a very interesting history. It is the cause of a lot of deaths for American settlers um, who, were, who were crossing the Plains states. The grass would get grazed down. The cows then would eat whatever was available, which would be the white snake root. And the toxins in the white snake root cause milk sickness. And so if you're drinking the milk from the cow that has eaten this, you will get sick and die. And in fact, Abraham Lincoln's mother died of milk sickness caused by this plant. But I don't have cows and the monarchs like it. So this weed is going to be staying because, you know, this was I, this was maybe two weeks ago and there's a lot, there's not very many nectar sources available by me right now, um, except for this. And so I'm like, hey, it, it, it's gonna stay because it's very beneficial to, to pollinators and the monarchs. There's also some caterpillars that are known to feed on the foliage. I did not dig into that further to see to see what kind, um, but it's a very beneficial plant as long as you don't have cows that are eating it. This is my swamp marigold and this this plant taught me an important lesson all summer. I did not like that plant. I bought it because I was curious and I regretted buying it. It was tall and gangly kind of ugly which seems to be the case for the first year with a lot of native plants. They're kind of ugly till they get established. Um, and then this fall, look at these blooms. It's so dainty and pretty. And then look at the foliage on it. There's like this, this beautiful green to like this violet red. It's just beautiful. Um, so now I'm kind of liking this plant, but it was a good lesson to learn that I just need to, like, I'm not going to tear anything out. I, everybody gets a year or two to get established before I decide that they, that they have to go. And this is blue vervain. In the summertime, it had really dainty little blue flowers all along these stems. And I'm just going to tell you, I don't have a picture of it because it wasn't really noteworthy. But now all of a sudden in the fall, I'm really loving the interest that it gives to the landscape with these with these kind of wild stems that are going. And then, um, as always, I'm going to circle back to the milkweed. So the swamp milkweed, I'm just going to admit it, I think I love it as much as the monarchs do. It The blooms are gorgeous all summer. The blooms are stunning. They smell wonderful. But then look at it this fall is gorgeous in the fall too. So there's these green leaves and then it's this awesome purple, reddish purple color on the leaves. It's just, and then like these variegated leaves. It's just gorgeous. Um, this is a common milkweed that grew up beside the swamp milkweed and it does not bear it. It does not, <laughs> it does not look as good in the fall. It kind of gets yellow with brown spots and it's not as stunning. But this is beautiful uh, in the fall. And then just some seed pods. Again, if I were going to try to start, I did try to start some milkweed from seed. I had mixed success probably because I wasn't exactly sure what I was doing. I, I, if I were going to do it again, I would collect this, this 
seed pod here is ready to be collected. And then you can store the seeds and plant them in the spring. Um, like I said, I did not have great success with that. I had better success finding a reputable nursery and buying my plants from them. And if you're doing that, um, it's not enough to just ask at the nursery, are these pesticide free? You need to find out who the nursery's supplier is because the nursery may not know. They may think that it is pesticide free, but the supplier has treated the plants. And if that is the case, then any monarch caterpillar that ate the leaves from this plant would most likely die. So that's what I mean when I say a reputable supplier. We have a great native plant nursery nearby. Um, and so that's where I, where, I've, where I get all my plants. He starts them from seed right there. So just, just be vigilant, be sure you check and make sure any plant that you buy is truly pesticide free or start from seed if you are better at that than I am. And then just again, more seed pods. There was just visually interesting. I, I think they're fascinating. And then I saved this infographic oh, probably two months ago. And I was I pulled it out the other day to look at what I wanted to think about adding into my yard for next spring. Again, remember, just replace one plant at a time with something that's native. And I got to looking and Wisconsin Monarch Collaborative. So this is gonna work for you in Wisconsin as well as me down here in, in Iowa. So the, to me, this is a great beginner list of, of um, milkweed. Here's common milkweed, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed. Um, those are the three basics and I would definitely start with those. They all seem to be really hardy. Um, and then, you know, there's the goldenrod for fall nectar. Um, you can kind of explore that on your own. And I'll share this in the, um, in the comments uh, when we're done here tonight so that you can get this and just download it on your phone. That way, whenever you're at the nursery, you can say, oh yeah, I need whatever plant you're kind of looking for. I'm kind of, I kind of have my eyes on these aromatic asters for next year. Okay, and then you know I was going to do it, um, plant milkweed. Um, if you're only going to plant one plant, plant milkweed, you have to help me with planting these billion milkweed stems um, to support the monarch migration. Um, so that concludes week three. If you have any questions, feel free to ask, and I will do my best to answer them in the comments. So thank you, Teresa. I have to admit, I am thrilled that you talked about the aphids and the milkweed because um, my sister and I have been going back and forth about that. And it makes sense that it's part of the whole insect and pollinator food chain. So, so that's, good, that's a good thing. That was really interesting for me to learn. And I'm gonna help you with the, million, the billion milkweed plants. Um, I, <laughs> I too have been unsuccessful in getting the milkweed to, to establish. Um, last year I went around and I kept some of the seeds and kind of sprinkled them where I thought they wanted to go. And then this year it was mysteriously new milkweed in other places. So um, maybe I'll have better luck buying established milkweed. I'll try that next, next year. Um, I did want to ask you about the, um, so the butterflies, why do you think they like the swamp milkweed more than the common? Because like in my backyard, I have more common. Do you, I have more common. I have no swamp milkweed. Is it the flowers that are different? Because it looks like on, from your pictures that there are more flowers on the swamp milkweed. I think, <laughs> okay, I, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> um, first of all, I think common takes longer to get to the point where it blooms. I think maybe year two or three, you're going to start getting blooms from that's just from my observation in what's going on with the milkweed in my ditch. The swamp milkweed blooms faster. I mean, the, the plants that I just planted this year all bloomed. So I think they bloom faster. 
<laughs> my experience is the monarch mamas like to lay eggs. I did not find a single egg on my common milkweed. All my monarch eggs were on my swamp milkweed, but the caterpillars prefer to eat the common milkweed. Hmm. And I did an experiment because I put in swamp milkweed because the leaves were really tender and they just looked <laughs> nicer. And I put in common and almost all of them, I would say nine out of 10, all went to the common milkweed to eat. Even though they were born, you know, they hatched out on swamp milkweed. They prefer to eat the common. So I think it's both important. I have found eggs on common milkweed, so they will lay eggs on that. Hmm. All right, cool. I, I don't know if that answers your question. It does, it does <laughs> because, you know, like now I'm going to try, I'm going to try, um, getting some swamp milkweed because this year I redid some of my yards like everybody wants to know about my gardens <laughs> I redid some of my gardens to put more butterfly bush and asters in so I'll I'll add that maybe I can get some now and maybe it'll establish before winter comes yeah I'm hope this I what I'm going to do in mine I want to have some some clumps of swamp right next to clumps of common milkweed. Like I think it needs to all be together right. and that way everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a buffet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I wanna thank you on behalf of everyone watching on our Facebook page and for everyone who's visiting now or during the week, um, Teresa will keep an eye out for your questions and we'll comment back and thank you once again and have a lovely evening. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> Bye. Bye.